Good evening, America. This is Tuesday, March 17th. This is the Refinery, where grassroots organizations come together to explore the best ways to make conservative messaging work to reach and influence more people. We're live via Google Hangout and text chat every Tuesday at 8.45 Central on therefinerieshow.com. You can go there anytime to watch, listen, and subscribe to the show via YouTube or podcast. I'm Leslie Price with the Conservative Union, joined also by Ryan Bickmore, also with the Conservative Union. Our partners at Free Radical Network are joined, are represented by J.D. Bryden, George Templeton, and Felicia Cravens. And then our also our other partners at Free Radical Network are joined only by Andy Pate today. His lovely bride, Corey, is, I don't know, she's, they say she's doing something important. She's probably out at a bar drinking green beer, if she's smart. And she is. So I'm sure that's where she is. The party of choice. They're, they're the party of choice. As much as we would love to have them on the Free Radical Network. What did too. I say? You said the Free Radical Network there, Leslie. You know. Well, okay. You guys you know, are Free Radical Network, and Andy's party of choice, and... You know, Corey's nonstop drunkenness has kept our marriage going for 11 years, and I really don't think it's good of you to rip on that. <laughs> It's the only way anyone can stay married to you for that many years. She sobered up once for like five minutes, took one look at me, and was just started crying and sobbing. I gave her a beer. <laughs> you gave her a beer because she was reaching for the phone to call the divorce lawyer? Smart man. Yep. Smart man. <laughs> you can't find it. But <laughs> Oh, wow. We're starting off early tonight. Starting off early tonight. Awesome. And... JD loves it when we pick on Andy because that means we're not picking on JD. So. Yes, uh, I prefer it that way. It's, it's maybe much we should stop calling ourselves the Refinery Show and call ourselves Mean Girls of America. Uh, that twelve-year-old's show. <laughs> That's, that could that could work. Nudies. <laughs> oh. I just love this. Yeah, don't pick on me. Don't pick on me. Don't pick on me. And he wears a Jets shirt. It's St. Yeah. Patrick's Day. I need to wear green so I wouldn't get pinched. Oh, come on. That's and like the, the Jets are on the up. The Jets, the Jets are, are on the up. Because they got an ex-Redskin as their coach now. Sure. Well, there you go, then. Okay, that's that's sportsing stuff, right? Sorry. Yeah, we're, we're too early. Too early in the show too to, to the devolve. Sports. Wait a minute. I heard that, the, that, 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 that name is... Politically incorrect. You know, we are Jets. not going there tonight, Andy. Oh, I'm talking Jets. What's the matter with Jets? Jets it's burn from West Side burn Story. fossil fuels. They burn oh. fossil fuels. I see. I see. Oh, you meant Redskins. Oh, okay. I I see. Jets burn fossil fuels. Those are bad. Bad. Oh wow. Can we race together away from this topic? <sighs> race. I mean, that's, oh, that's that's that's, that's an order to. We Let's, can definitely, definitely do it faster than any of your players. Let's oh, race. Wow. Let's race together to yeah. our first real topic Please. of realness. Um, and part of the reason I think most of us are a little giddy today is that after being a bit concerned about the fate of Israel and thus the fate of the free world, um, it turns out that. Benjamin Netanyahu is probably going to go ahead and be the next prime minister. He has apparently won enough that he's going to be able to make a, make enough of a coalition. And what this really means, and the part that makes me so happy, is that Obama's string of losses at the polls is unbroken. He keeps losing, he keeps losing, and he keeps losing. And as Felicia said, battleground Israel is no more successful than Battleground Texas was. Couldn't be more thrilled. Couldn't be more thrilled to have them waste money and be unsuccessful in rallying opposing forces. Although the scandal is going to be that our tax dollars ended up paying for the opposition to Benjamin Netanyahu, which that's that's a scandal that I'm sure will be told is no big deal and old news and a distraction. And, I did not have electoral relations with that nation, Israel, whatever it is. Anyway, this is all foreign relations, foreign matters stuff, and foreign matters. Huh. There's a podcast called that, isn't there, George? There is. There is a show on Spreecast on Thursday nights at 10 p.m. 
and we will dive headlong and very in depth into the election into the Israeli election here. I I would caution everyone. Yes, the Bibi Netanyahu's party, Likud, which is the which is the right you know the the right wing party or or a right wing party or center right party has won the most votes and that's good, but it still has to form a coalition, which could be pro which can be problematic, especially because I think that the uh, the the uh, the uh, the replacement for labor, the uh, Zionist uh, Union, is going to do anything they can to try to to try to get a coalition together, and they'll promise anything if it comes right down to it to try to to try to uh, boot Bibi Netanyahu out of office. Well, and they already have like they had basically fifty percent of the vote, right? I mean, it's it's very close. I mean, it was Bibi may have won, but not not by so much. And I don't understand the way all the eleven parties and all of that works. Well, okay, here's how it works. Let's let's just go through that real quick. First. These are these are the elections for the the Knesset, which is the uh, which is the body that uh, makes all the laws in Israel, and it's 120 seats. You get you need 61 in a coal. You need to win 61 or form a coalition with 61 to be able to form the government. Uh, it is a proportional representation system, which is and it is the same system that they use in the European elections for the European Union for the Parliament. And you have to reach a certain threshold of a percentage to get seats. That's how it works. And that was changed recently. It used to be it used to be not all that long ago that you only needed one percent and you'd get a couple seats. And then it was two uh, percent, and now it's three percent, three and a quarter percent. So you have you're going to have up to ten or eleven parties represented in <clears throat> in the Knesset. Likud is ahead. Much to the uh, much to the sorrow of, of our current president here in America, and to the surprise of most of the media in Israel, Likud is ahead right now. And actually, there's just a new there's just a new update that's come in. There are now 90 percent of the 90 percent of the precincts are in, and they have Likud on 30 seats. And Likud is the is Bibi Netanyahu's party. It is the center right party that is uh, led is that is led Israel for the last. Uh, for I guess I guess now since since the middle of the last decade, so almost 10 years now, they have 30 seats. The the rebranded Labor Party, which is now called the Zionist Union, and it's made up of that's made up of labor, labor and the remnants of the Kadima Party. They're on 24 seats, uh, and these are the two these are the two parties that are going to try to form a coalition so that they can be the next so that uh, their respective leaders can be the next prime minister. Now Likud should be successful. Uh, one of the uh, parties that they're partnering with, uh, uh, which is the Jewish Home Party, has got eight seats, and they will probably bring in the Shas Party and the United Torah Judaism Party. They've been coalition partners before, and between them, that's another 14 seats. So you're talking about, I guess, that's 52 seats at that point. So really, it comes down to this party, which is really a centrist party called the Kulana Party, and they've been in they've been in coalition before with. Benjamin Netanyahu, and I think most folks expect them to join again. Now, the president, we all know about the story of the uh, this little group that was getting money from our government and was essentially helping, trying to help Zionist, the Zionist Union win the election over there. So this is a setback for President Obama. There's, there's no question about it, although it's a bigger setback for the people that, that have hammered away at Likud because... Benjamin Netanyahu's focus has been so much the outside. It's been so much Iran. It's been so much trying to protect the country, which is understandable. But domestically, in terms of domestic issues, they probably haven't done as good a job as they should. Now, I have I, I think, in one sense, this wasn't what Netanyahu was hoping for, because I think he thought two years. I think he thought after only two years of, of this particular current edition of the Knesset that he would get a lot more seats than he got. But still, people were saying he was going to lose. They weren't going to be the largest party. Well, they are. And they're probably going to form the next government again. I think it's going to be a fairly stable coalition because it's not going to be nearly as broad. Like the last coalition he had was very broad. It included the remnants of Kadima, which have now joined the Labor Party. It included Zippy Livni, who is the most aggressive person in the pro-Palestinian state peace camp. It included people like Yair Lapid, who was in, who has his own party called Yeshatid. And I don't think the uh, coalition's going to include them this time. And I think it's going to be a more uh, right-wing, 
center right coalition than before. And I think the, the, the big question, the big, the kingmaker is going to be the Kalana party, and Moshi Kalan will probably demand the role as finance minister, and he'll probably get it. And that's the way this works. That's how these deals are made. It's it's nothing. There's nothing. Um, there's nothing underhanded about it. This is the way. This is the way you. This is the way you you form a government in a place like Israel because you're not going to win enough votes to get 61 seats. It doesn't happen. It's never happened in the history of elections in that country. So it looks very good for Bibi Netanyahu. They're going to have the most. They're going to have the most seats in the Knesset again, and they're going to probably form a stable government. And that's important. That's important because it does give him a mandate to continue pushing hard internationally against the Iran nuke deal. The talk that, that that was a failure, that was, that was you heard, I heard that all last week over the weekend and leading up, and, uh, leading up to the day, that his speech in Washington didn't work, that it, uh, that it galvanized people against him because it made it look like there was more distance between Israel and the United States, which is something that's a major issue over there. They are very much believers, the voters over there are very much treasure the friendship between the USA and Israel, and they don't want to see anybody damaging it. So, and, they'll, and the left, to be fair, tried to make an issue of that and said he did damage it because Obama's president. That didn't work. All the other things that have gone on, that have, all the other attacks in the media from places like Haaretz didn't work. So, I, this is Bibi is to be congratulated, but he's going to have to he's going to have to make sure that there's more attention to the domestic issues and the domestic side of things. It's not just about protecting Israel, which is very important. It's going to have to do better on those things also. Yeah, that was something that I heard a lot about. And, and uh, I, I, again, I just want to thank George for, for coming on and, and talking about this uh, here on the refinery. And, and I can't wait to hear you and Stefan and, and maybe even Brass talk about this even more in depth on foreign matters on Thursday. Uh, on, on Spreecast, we'll we'll have links to that in in the uh, description at the end of the at the end of the uh, you know once once the show's up. Um, but I I had heard that that there was a lot of uh, attacks on on Netanyahu for being so defense oriented and being defense minded, and I thought that was, I mean, is that really the case when you were surrounded by that much danger? It just hmm, seems weird. But remember, just like here, we have a, an electorate that tends to not really care so much about foreign policy, and they will vote their own personal pocketbook. I, you know, the people in Israel are no different, and you know, cost of living goes up, and wages are down. If they are, uh, I don't even know. Uh, that's what they're going to be paying attention to, because their national survival against the enemies. That's constant state for them. I mean, ever since, for all of them, the entirety of their lives has been spent in a place where they are surrounded by enemies who want them all to die and stop existing. So that's that's always been the case. But as far as personal economics, they've had good days and bad days, and they want more good days, and Bibi's been ignoring it. So, uh, you know, I, I think the economy was a, a weakness or a lack of focus for him. And it just as it is for us. Yeah, I guess. Sorry, go ahead, George. And I just want to, I was going to make this point in the backboard chat, but I want to make this point here. The left in Israel feels like the, the peace solution is an obvious one, that they that there's got to be a two-state solution. You have to give the Palestinians a state. And they believe that Netanyahu uses what's going on with Iran and what's going on with, you know, Hamas and these things to deflect from the relatively mediocre performance on it, on domestic issues and they believe and, and that's they, they don't think it's as big a problem as it is they really don't and, but but that's on foreign matters at 10 o'clock on Thursday on spreecast we will we will delve very deep into this we will tell you about all the parties where they stand what they believe what you know what they're going to be looking for and how if it's not already formed by then how we think this coalition will work how or who who will be in it? But that's that's what that's what the leftist parties in Israel think about Netanyahu and think about Likud in general, and that's why they they de-emphasize some of these things. They really do. 
Well, and I, you know, obviously BB didn't have a huge victory or anything, but I think maybe a led. I'm I'm looking for, you know, how the, how does this matter to the conservative movement and our messaging of it? I think what we're learning and what we're seeing is that the victorious politicians are the ones who stand clearly on a particular side and on a particular issue and are upfront about it and don't back down in the face of withering criticism. Obama is very much that way. He stands strong on his progressive credentials and he personally wins elections because people like him and what he stands for and what they think he's going to do you know what they believe that he stands for and what he says when we have successful conservative politicians it's because they are standing up for themselves their beliefs their and they and they really do make the case rather than being the mushy moderates mushy moderates simply don't win and we're seeing that I think that's the message that's the message I choose to take out of it I'm you know an optimist I guess I don't know well it sounds to me like neither side's mushy in Israel per se but I, what, if the left takes over how are they going to handle Iran are they just like okay go get the bomb it's all it's all good who cares what it does to destabilize the Middle East I'm speaking extre in extremes here because I don't know I, I don't know the situation there, but it would seem to me, are they actually taking lightly the threat of the Palestinians? Do they actually take lightly the threat of Iran? I, I think they, I think they believe what a lot of others believe that Iran is not that close to the bomb. I think they, they certainly don't want Iran, Iran to get the bomb. Let's 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 put that out there. There isn't a party, there isn't a party in Israel that wants that. But I think they don't believe they're as close, and I and they may even believe this deal is good. I, that I don't know. I, I'm not. I that's something that Stefan and I I think are going to look into the next couple of days to see if they if their views on this deal. But they but the left in in Israel strongly believes in trading land for peace. They believe in it because the last two times they've been in, in charge, they've done that. Now it's not worked, and what I can't understand is why they would think it would work because it plainly doesn't. There, there, there's been not one but two intifadas after they've tried to do it, and okay. that's with them given you know the, the PLO and then the PA you know ninety something percent of what they wanted. So that's and I think that's what voters realized is that they 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 may not like Netanyahu some of these folks, but but they stared down the barrel and realized. These guys are going with the same damn plan that doesn't work, and I can't vote for that. And I think that's, for good or for ill, being a conviction politician that Netanyahu is, at least they're like, well, at least on this issue we know he's right. He may not be perfect on these other issues, and, and the funny thing is one of, one of you brought up the cost of living. That was, that was the main issue that, that the Zionist Union, that Moretz, some of these other, you know, center left parties and left wing parties campaigned on. That has become that seems like I think you're gonna see it in every election. England as well. You saw you saw the Congress Party try it in India last year and it failed miserably. The cost of living, the cost of living, the cost of living. That is the central issue for the left in these big elections, and not just in Israel, but in many other countries. Leslie made a really interesting point in the in the, uh, in the chat here that we have uh, about progressives believe in feeling and intent, not in results. In Israel as well as America, that those are this those those are trends that certainly seem to follow through from one side to the other. So, I think that's I think that's an interesting an interesting point uh, to make, and and certainly I, I can't wait to uh, to hear more about this. In uh, on on Thursday night uh, on on Foreign Matters ten ten uh, o'clock on on Spreecast, and these guys jump into these topics and go in depth and and it's it's really awesome to uh, to listen to so so be sure to uh, to be there live the the chat room sorry Fishy go ahead no I was gonna say I, I want us to pause and and really pitch. Uh, foreign matters for people. A lot of people in our chat also in that chat as well. But for folks who haven't seen it before, haven't looked, this is one of the only shows on the right anywhere on the internet that focuses on an in-depth look at foreign policy, 
foreign affairs, events across the world. You watch this show just for a couple of hours at max on Thursday night and you will know more than most people in this country about foreign affairs. These guys are thorough and they are really professional in the way they look at this stuff, but funny and it's not it's not watching something on, you know, CBS on Sunday morning. It is funny and engaging, but these guys are serious about foreign policy and exploring America's place in the world. I cannot recommend this show enough. They don't talk about any of those countries that aren't America, do they? Because I find that offensive. <laughs> Personally. On occasion they do, and, and they have funny videos from Russia, too. That's, that's a part of their, their repertoire, so... Uh, it is it is an excellent watch, and something that I'm so proud. Like this is, I mean, this is this is like the third third year almost. We're we're in there. Foreign Matters has been going for a long time now, and uh, it's it's Two really and exciting. Half years. Two and a half. It's we're we're getting there. Um, I, going from from uh from Foreign Matters uh and and the whole fact that nobody could put BB in the corner. Um, I want to talk about somebody else who didn't want to be put in the corner, and and this is uh, something that actually uh, the doctor, Pradeep Shankar, posted in Conservative Union in in our uh, in in the group just a little bit before the show started, and uh, we needed it was it was so mind blowing that we had to rearrange the show just because we need to talk about it. Um, Mickey Kaus. Uh, left the Daily Caller today. Uh, he he up and quit because Tucker Carlson pulled a post that he he wrote uh, about Fox News. Uh, Mickey Kaus, uh, you know, is is a, a you know well known blogger. Kaus files not not to be confused with the Daily Cost. Completely different. Sounds similar. Not the same thing. Um, and he came from Mickey Kaus is generally known as a liberal or leftist or left of center which uh, he's more of a left of center guy he's more um, of a yeah moderate and he's been at slate yes uh and and uh, he was actually writing a piece about fox news and how fox news wasn't really pulling its weight on the story about amnesty and illegal immigration that they were not doing their job as the counterpoint to uh you know the the vast left wing uh, media sphere, you know, they they weren't acting as as their counterbalance, and uh, you know, it was critical of Fox saying that they need to step it up about about illegal immigration and executive amnesty, which we'll be talking about later, and uh, he he went to bed at six thirty having having put the uh, the the article in into uh, into drafts or, or no up up on the on the site. And when he woke up, Tucker Carlson had taken it down, saying that, dude, I work there. We can't be talking bad about Fox News. That's insane. That is mind-blowing that we would have... I mean, Daily Caller is one of the big media outlets for, for, the, for, for the right. I mean, it's, it's something that... I mean, when you think of the Blaze, Breitbart, Daily Caller, Independent Journal Review, they are pretty much the big four, in my mind at least, when you're talking about the mainstream conservative news outlets. You know, they're the big the big ones. They're the big names. You know, you also have Hot Air and all those guys on the on the side, Town Hall. But those are those are the ones that I've I've really sort of changed from being little islands in the conservative sphere to being really major uh, powers. And we have Tucker Carlson, who does work at Fox News, come on and say, you know, say to one of his writers, "No, you can't post that because it's critical of Fox News." That, that's not who we are. That's not what we do. That's what the left does, and and it's really it's absolutely irresponsible. It's it not in any way censored, any way, shape, or form. It's not journalism at all. Well, and it's, it's against so conservative principles because if constructive criticism is not allowed on the right because the target is Fox News, which is the only game in town on cable news on the right. Then what are we? I, I have a problem with that. 
I have criticisms of Fox News. I've stopped watching Fox News, but I've stopped watching television news anyway. I'm better informed just uh, with all the sources that I have on the internet. But are we really saying here, Tucker Carlson, that constructive criticism is only allowed if it's not someone with whom you're affiliated? Uh, you know, and keep in mind, Fox News probably didn't report too much about uh, Rupert Murdoch and the business going on in England, which I bet George could talk about when they were, you know, hacking celebrities um, as computers or phones or something like that. Um, there was a lot of controversy over that. I bet George could fill that out a little bit better. Yeah, that was, I didn't see a lot on Fox, and it was really bad. That was the stuff that also Piers Morgan was involved in when he was at the Daily Mail, where they were, they weren't just hacking celebrities' phones, they hacked the dead girl's phone. And you know, there were people that, uh, that were put on trial, including people that were advising David Cameron, and I think somebody went to jail over it, but I, I'd have to go back and look. But yeah, Fox News, which of course is owned by Rupert Murdoch and News Corp, I, I won't say they completely blanked it, but they didn't. They didn't really do. They didn't really do much on the story at all. So you 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 are quite correct. And and but it, I mean I think we have to remember where Tucker Carlson's come from too. I think before he was at the Daily Caller, he was at CNN. And I know he's. I think he worked at MSNBC for a little while. I'm not sure. And I just think that somebody like him, I've never I've never been a big fan of, and I'm just going to leave it at that because what I really said about him, I'm going to leave to the background chat because I don't want to be too rude on this show because we're not here to just slam the hell out of everybody except maybe some liberals. Speak, speak, speak for yourself. Have you ever seen this show? We've <laughs> I mean, I was kidding. Some we've liberals. We've talked about Rush Limbaugh. We've talked about Mark Levin. We've done so much stuff, talked about other conservatives in ways that, you know, we... But see, I don't want to get personal. I don't want to uh, get personal. That's oh, what I don't want to do. And we, we, what we've done on this show, what you've all done on this show, to your great credit, is we've talked about the substance of what they've said and not the actual person. Oh well, yeah, because personalities hand, don't the matter. Actual I mean, person. Yeah, that, because we try to focus on what's good for messaging in the conservative movement, and we do have to critic. We do have to point it out when our side messages incorrectly, um, because we want them to get it right. So we have to point out what they're doing wrong. Well, you know. besides. Besides which, we're like South Park. We hate everyone. Pretty much. The, the Justice Department actually has us listed as a hate group. <laughs> we hate ourselves. We hate everybody. <laughs> I had to bribe. I had to actually bribe a couple people to get that designation. But it, you know, it's worth it. And well done, you. <laughs> yeah. Quick question. I mean, um, not to be too nice to Tucker. I have no idea about the story. But what have we heard of his side? I mean. Do we do we do we actually know what the review of what the article looks like? Is it do we know from his point of view that he only pulled it because it was critical of Fox, or might he have thought that the way it was critical was out of line? I don't know. I'm just asking. Well, yeah. I don't think you're going to get Tucker to comment on that. He, he um, commented, but it wasn't. It was not on the specifics of why the piece was was taken down. Right. It's just we're going to be sorry to see Mickey leave. Yes, it was very milk toast. Which is what you have to do if you're in that position. You know, I didn't. I wouldn't expect anything other than that from him. There will not be a Tucker Carlson side coming out. No, and uh, well, as as P Dog is saying over here on the chat, um, since the Daily Caller is Tucker Carlson's site, he owns it. It's his show. Um, it's absolutely Tucker's right to pull to pull the piece, um, but. The Daily Caller isn't owned by Fox. You know, I can understand Fox not reporting on the Rupert Murdoch thing because Rupert is their dad, um, and they were reporting on their dad. And so what we're saying is that it, we're, what we're seeing is that Tucker Carlson is thinking of Fox as if it's his parent when it actually isn't. It's just a place where he goes and gets paid, or he, either he pays them or they pay him, whatever, to be on TV. Um, and from what I understand, actually, I think it was Jonah Goldberg or somebody who wrote an article recently that a lot of these people who are on Fox News and on the other cable news shows, they're paying to be on those shows. They're not getting paid by Fox News to come on the show. They are paying to be the expert. And I think that's why we see CARE as How the expert on a lot work? of things. I don't know. But they're paying because they're promoting themselves and their book and their show. Um, like, 
you know, if when Charlie Cook is shows up all of a sudden on every Fox show to talk about his book, that's he's he's paying to promote his show so, to promote his book. So it's actually an advertising expense. I don't know how all of that works, um, but it certainly isn't that Fox News pays all of the all of their guests to come on the show it's a it's a very weird kind of cloudy thing the way the finances work um, but you know somebody's making money off of it but in in many cases it's Fox News that's making money for having the guy on the show so but but Tucker maybe he is an employee of Fox News and maybe he should have communicated to Mickey that you don't criticize my employer I don't know if that's the deal and it's certainly nobody's arguing that it's not Tucker's right um, and I don't know that I don't know that Mickey would even argue that it's not his right. He's simply saying because of this, that's why I that's why I have chosen to leave. And it, you know that's fine. Once you find out this thing about your employer, if it's something that you, you don't find acceptable, then you do you do leave and you state openly that's that's the case. Um, I I don't like the fact that the Daily Caller finds it unacceptable to criticize Fox News. And I think it's reasonable for Mickey to assume that the reasoning is because if you criticize Fox News, they won't have you on the show, and you won't get famous, and your website won't make money. It, that's a reasonable assumption for Mickey to make about the reason Tucker pulled the article. Yeah, it, it's – and obviously we can't know, and, and Fishy said, we're not going to get Tucker's honest – uh, answer about this. He's, the, we're only going to get the the nondescript general answer, or general response of you know we're sad to see Mickey Kaus leave. It's it's absolutely crazy to me that this is the way that we're behaving on the right, and that 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 this that we're allowing Fox News to be this kind of a of a you know dictator of of what is good and what is successful. And I, I haven't been the biggest fan of, of The Blaze in, you know, the past three years, four years, whatever. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not the biggest Glenn Beck fan, but maybe Mickey is going to go over there. I mean, to me, I want more competition in my media. I, I always want to have more competition in my media. And if this means that maybe The Blaze is going to get some, some more people... I, you know, I'm, I'm happy about that. I want, I want to have some real journalism and some real reason to, uh, you know, watch these channels, and that's going to come about by having increased competition. That's what we believe in on the conservative side, and not not being critical of, of something like Fox News, it takes away that competition aspect. It takes away, you know, you are, you are shielding a company from, from uh, the, the kind of competitive disadvantage that it would create for itself. So, I don't know, it just, it, it's amazing to me that, that Tucker, who I, again, is not one of my favorite people, but I've been, I've been happy with him more recently. I, I, of the big four, the Daily Caller is a, is a place that I really enjoy reading. This really disappoints me, and I hope that, the, that both the Daily Caller and Fox News, you know, people, people jump ship and, and move over someplace else, because that, this can't, you know, this can't happen. Are we really turning this way into this movement where things are about this unity of opinion, that there are monsters that we don't talk about, there are 800-pound gorillas in the room that we don't acknowledge or, or whatever? Are we really going to be that way where we can't have those honest discussions? I understand the need to present a united front in some ways, and that Fox's large numbers that trump all these other cable news networks is a sign of strength and force on the right. But if it's filtered through the what we can and can't talk about based on you know who we can and can't criticize and whatever, I just think that's a flaw in our model. And I think um, there, there is a lot of... Oh, I'm sorry, George. Go ahead. I was just going to say, and Fox needs competition to stay stay at the top and, and improve. If you wanted to take a look at what no competition has done to an industry, take a look at newspapers, take a look at network television news, it's fetid, it's declining, it's dying, and it's because they went unchallenged forever, so they just they just slid into these they slid into this idea that they were 
activists and they had to put their viewpoint for instead of reporting the news. They got worse and worse and worse, and now they are in terrible shape. Absolutely. I mean, I, I will... Uh, I really believe that we do have a problem on the right in that, and I've talked about this before, the power brokers on the right, there is really an echelon to where if you want to make a difference, it's who you know. And I know that's true. Don't get me wrong, folks. I know that's true in every single organization. I get it, okay? But it has gotten really powerful. It has gotten really powerful. We out here in Colorado, it's, it's kind of interesting because we just had a complete change of leadership in our party. Our uh, party leadership went Tea Party this uh, this past Saturday, and so that's going to shake it all up. But there are echelons within the Tea Party that you've got to know. You've got to know this. You got to know that person, and so forth. So it's going to be very very scary. And so when I look at what's happening at at um, Fox News, it doesn't surprise me. It really doesn't surprise me at all. Because people move up in the in the conservative world of media, they move up in the conservative world of politics, and quite honestly, they become very how do I put this gently self confident. And <laughs> that is that is putting it quite gently there, Andy. That's a that's a nice nice phrasing there. Well, you know, we all know that there are people who make their way and they they achieve a certain following, and then. Their, their work becomes about building and, and increasing that following to the exclusion of anybody else, uh, you know, as though they are in competition to put other people out of the business. And then there are other people's, people who use that opportunity that they've been given to bring others along with them that have interesting voices and to boost them as well. And, and I, I just, I know which side I prefer. Yeah, I mean, um, if you go, you go to, you go to, um, party meetings, you go to the stuff, and it's just constantly, constantly, constantly speed networking, self-promotion, again and again and again. And here I just want to talk to somebody and get their ideas and thoughts on something. And it, I don't know, folks. I don't know. It, it has become such a web on the right. And I love the right. I adore the right. I love all the – there isn't a group on the right I don't love. There really isn't. That's just the way I am, and I because I come from the left, and I know what we're fighting. But it is so hard to move up, and it's also you. Re, there are it's not just Fox News. There are so many entities that you cannot be critical of. You know, if you're critical of Ted Cruz, who I happen to love, I, I don't recall ever being critical of him. But if I were critical of Ted Cruz, I would be out in several in several sectors. See what I mean? People have become very brittle and very defensive and very my way or the highway. And I thought that was the left. I thought that was their thing. Yeah, same thing with, I mean, I, I, started, I started off the segment talking about it, but, you know, we've, we've talked about Mark Levin, we've talked about Rush Limbaugh before, and we've seen the comments that that generates. If we don't, if, if one does not speak, you know, Extremely uh, floweringly about these people, about and and say that with such praise, the 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 correct amount of uh, the correct amount of praise for for these people, Sarah Palin, t take your pick. There there are tons of them on the right that if you don't, you know, go out of your way to say good things about, people start, you know, spreading rumors that you're one of those nasty rhinos out there. You don't want to be a rhino because rhinos are bad people. And they're not true conservatives, and they uh, only hurt the movement. They don't help it. Aye. And there, and there is some wisdom to what they're saying because, let's face it, every time one of us on the right tears into someone else, and I'm not saying we should suddenly censor ourselves, but what what does the leftist media do? It immediately highlights that we're divided. The right's divided. You see a million stories on it. So I understand people saying, look, that's so easily used by the other side. That's why you got to be so careful. I get that. But there seems to be a real power structure, too. You know, when I came, I was raised by parents who were leftists, but I was raised where ego, power, these things meant nothing. They mean nothing. Okay? They're, they're, they're absolutely empty. And, and yet I come to the right and, and I didn't think I would I would find so many people so proud of their position. 
you know, who want to, who want, who want that limo to meet them at the airport. And yet, I've I've seen it, and it really, really discourages a lot of the people out in the field. Let me close with this. Here's the big problem, leaders. Here's the big problem. I got news for you. The people out in the field on your side are broke. Okay, they're not rich like the left. They're not hooked in with the union at work. Okay, they're not the 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 donors who who are, who are holding parties at a thousand a head. They're broke. They they can't buy your influence. They thought that you were supposed to look at them and value all individuals because all individuals are valuable and you want the ideas that come from every individual and you're not going to say because this individual is connected to this one and this one and this one, their ideas must be better. I don't care who you're connected to. I want to know what your idea is. And I just wish that that kind of respect and valuing for individuality was happening more on the right. I, I just have to add full disclosure that when I was on Fox News twice, um, I refused the car service. I just want you to know. How like a Texan. Bring it up. Of course, you you know, just just absolutely terrible. That was your moment oh. of humble brag. Exactly. It was a, it was a it was an awesome humble brag. Literally a humble brag. Yeah, but you yeah, but you had that 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 that, that guy pull you in that wagon. <laughs> yes, but they were lashing along, and you know, you, you know, and and Hannity went on to great things. You shouldn't have treated him that way. <laughs> That's my problem. Yes. So that was one of those odd jobs that Hannity had. I um, speaking of odd, well, no, this there's there's absolutely no transition here uh, from from jobs to to the next thing that that we wanted to talk about. But it is really, it's an interesting thing. Uh, there's been a lot, of, a lot of stuff happening in Texas in, in your legislature. And it's, I, I don't know, something's in the water down there. People are getting really uh, ornery over, over things. Throwing signs, uh, telling people that they're going to get arrested or, or have to pay ridiculous fines if they film cops within 100 feet or some, some ridiculousness. What's going on over there? You're muted, Fishy. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, yeah. Texas are Texas. Um, every two years when the Texas legislature gets together, there's always some kind of antics or, or fun. And, you know, we were two years ago treated to the spectacle of uh, the entire left, uh, I guess mob that they could round up uh, protesting on the Capitol steps inside the Capitol, uh, on the Capitol grounds over pro-life legislation that was going to be introduced. Well, things are not really looking like that's going to happen. Of course, uh, my sweet friend Connie Burton has taken Wendy Davis's seat, so uh, in the Senate, so there's no Wendy Davis or to kick her around anymore. But. Um, there was a recent day where Planned Parenthood had scheduled a, a visit to the Capitol Day, and several of the legislators, several of the legislators, including Jonathan Strickland, who I know, put signs that looked sort of like the official signs that go on their office doors that said, you know, the legislator's name and then former fetus. And just because Planned Parenthood was going to be there, and Planned Parenthood stated that they were there to talk about um, low-income women's testing for breast and cervical cancer and that they were lobbying for the Texas uh, to continue that program. I don't even know if that program was in jeopardy, but they were there to lobby ostensibly for that purpose. And Representative Strickland thought he would uh, tweak them, and his actual quote was that um, he wanted to let them know that organizations that murder children are not welcome in my office. And so it was a funny little thing that they did just to tweak the nose of Planned Parenthood. Well, a Democrat legislator at, reportedly got very upset, marched down to these offices, took Representative Strickland's sign down, threw it at his staff, and intimidated them, and so the whole business of 
uh, just tweaking their nose, became a confrontation between these two representatives. Republican. He was a Republican. He oh, was the... Repu- um, he was Are a Republican sure? representative that that threw. Yes, I I, I looked at this, I looked this up and I was astounded to see an R next to the guy's name. Oh yes, that's right. He's a Fort Worth Republican. Yeah, and uh, eh, interestingly, I had missed that. You know, but interestingly, yeah. So this is two Republicans getting into it. Isn't that interesting? On R violence and and it's like. Over over a plan over something meant to plan to tweak Planned Parenthood in Texas. So Washington doesn't have the monopoly on juvenile politicians. Apparently not. I mean, and and it's been disputed whether the guy threw the sign or what. But it's it's just that was that was the thing that really struck me was the fact that this is a this is a Republican who was was doing this, not not a Democrat. You know. What is what is the motive there? Well, there are some places in Texas that you won't get elected if there's a D after your name. So he might be a Democrat at heart, but he calls himself a Republican just so he can actually get elected in that area. There are people who call him a rhino. Did you did you just call him a dino? You call him a yeah rhino. Yeah, Rhino, Republican wow. name only. It happens there have been there have been certainly been judges in Texas who have called themselves Republican so that they could run on the Republican ticket even though they're Democrat philosophically right down the line. Uh, yeah, you, Rick Perry, Gore campaign, Texas. I'm just saying. Yeah, absolutely. Oh man, this is like the twilight zone of, of the refinery. We we are we have we have entered into this area where it is so unusual. It's it's not the it's not the typical situation here. We're we're we are so confused. Well party so affiliation is, you know, what organization are you going with in order to get elected and be in a position of power to implement your objectives. We Tea Party libertarian types talk about using the structure of and then the structure of the Republican Party to accomplish our objectives. So how is that different from some that other is- politician using the structure of the Republican Party to obje- uh, accomplish his objectives? That is a very good point because when I was training people way back in 2009 to become part of party politics, you know, get into the leadership and do things. I did it from a nonpartisan perspective. Now I told people that my experience was with the Republican Party, but the things that I was doing translated to both parties in Texas as far as the law was concerned. And that wouldn't it be interesting if you had people from Tea Party on the right pushing into the Republican Party and from the right pushing into the Democrat Party depending on where they lived. And it would have made a big difference if I think Tea Party folks had done both rather than hitch themselves merely to one party. They could have achieved two different things at once. It might be that that was too much to tackle at the time, but it's still a viable a viable strategy too. Why not get a Tea Party person to sign up as the Democrat challenger to Sheila Jackson Lee? Because no Republican in that district is ever going to win. And it's only going to be during the primary that you challenge Sheila Jackson Lee in the primary for that nomination. Why not? That's that's, that's the only way you could. That's the only way to. In some areas, that's the only way to knock a Democrat incumbent out, or the only way to knock a Republican incumbent out is not as the opposing party, but to infiltrate and run in that party because of gerrymandering and all other sorts of evil buzzwords. What about Green Party? I mean, it is, you know, St. Patrick's. Well, I'm just well, saying. You, you, you just go with whatever feels right to you, Andy. <laughs> I want to infiltrate something that only has like eight members nationwide. You can be I, their I, presidential so, so nominee. Wait a second. So, so the Libertarian Party then. What? There's a reason but why all of the, there's a reason why all of the good libertarians are in the Republican Party. It's because exactly. the Libertarian Party sucks. It doesn't do anything, and it is the most dif- dysfunctional party out there. And you are, so, you're the most libertarian one here. I I know that. That's why I'm saying that the Libertarian Party sucks, but libertarians don't. That's why most of the good ones are in the GOP. Because uh, this is it. the 
you, you and I now are going to have to find a way together to hit the button and go to war against some country. And, and yeah, and we're going to ban marijuana. And we're, we're going to do lots of things. I, I just want you to know, I want to force schools to teach about Jesus. <laughs> this, is, this is, you know what, I think my coalition is going to be stronger than your coalition. There, Andy. <laughs> that's, that's what I think. That's what I'm going to work on. Well, together, let's take over the Green Party first. Just saying. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Speaking of, uh, no, I'm not going to say speaking of because we, we just we just use the speaking of uh, transition. Um, but but I do I do think that we should probably switch switch topics here. We've been on this for a while. Um, fishy. In, instead of instead of usually what usually happens uh, on the refinery where it's Andy who's written something and we you know there's there's this this mad rush to figure out oh is it going to be out tomorrow is it going to be out you know, when when is it going to be out? Uh, Fishy actually wrote a piece before but, the refinery, and it's up now, and you can actually read it now. But we're not quite done with Texas yet. Oh, that's right. We aren't quite done with Texas yet. I'm yes. sorry. There's so much, so much stuff, craziness happening in Texas. Uh. Yes. So in Texas, not only do we have that little bit of uh, interesting... Uh, I guess Republican on Republican um, uh, violence, I guess you'd say. We also have a Republican who is putting forth a bill to prevent people from filming police officers within 25 feet or 100 feet if they are carrying a weapon, if they are carrying with their uh, gun permit or whatever. And this is fascinating because this guy not only made this claim, but when he started getting pushback, tweeted out, hey, if you don't like it, vote me out of office. And Justin Amash retweeted that and said, his constituents, take him up on it. So the point of this bill is not just to prevent, uh, well, okay, the ostensible purpose of this bill is to prevent organizations which are rather aggressive, like Cop Block and others, who tend to become confrontational with police and escalate certain times of confrontations and, and interactions. It's meant to steer that kind of, a, of an altercation from turning bad. Um, what it's done, though, is carve out an exception for news media. And there's a certain uh, list of all the ways, all the groups, magazines, newspapers, uh, television stations, it lists who is media, and there are a whole bunch of sources, especially bloggers, who are left out of this as well. So um, this has not been received well in Texas. There are plenty of people who have noticed that Rest Representative Vialba, is his name, hasn't even got another co-sponsor as of the last reading I read on the story, not even one co-sponsor for this bill. It is not going to pass. There's no groundswell behind it. But it's a move on his part, theoretically, to get police organizations and police-related organizations to support him uh, financially or you know, with their, their unions or whatever. I'm not certain how that's going to play out, but it is going to be very interesting come the fall when filings for the next year's election has happened uh, to find out whether he draws an opponent on the Republican side in the primary. I would imagine is, so. Is this, I mean, what's the reasoning? Just the safety issue? I mean, are they, po can you point to any stats? Are they posing some sort of a, a serious safety problem? I mean, I do put the safety of the cops number one. Because they should, they put our safety number one. So, but I, I, I don't like the, I don't like the law. It doesn't sound good. Right, it doesn't. And the cops already have plenty of opportunity in a situation to declare that someone is being uh, uncooperative. They have means to deal with that as it stands. This isn't allowing cops any more rights. It's preventing opportunities for people to record them. The twenty-five foot and the hundred foot. Um, 
limitations on and the, the range by which you have to be separated from them are important. Not everyone's recording information, recording equipment can pick up audio and so you can't really document very well from that distance uh, whether it's 25 feet or 100 feet you know that you lose audio quality. Not only that but if you are at your front door and you have a narrow or a shallow lawn and the police are arresting someone in your front yard at your front yard you couldn't film them even on your property even not anywhere near the the situation itself but because it came to you you couldn't do it it makes very little if no sense to me bloggers are up in arms about it because if there's no protection there's no exception for people who are blogging and that just makes it seem like it's specifically targeted for that group cop block and others like it does, does, does this representative oppose like body cameras that have been talked about does he oppose like cameras on the police uh, so that, that so that whenever they have an interaction it's filmed and people can look at it or does he or because he does he want no cameras at all or is he okay with like body cameras the legislation is silent on police body cameras or anything like that. I think that's separate bills that are being offered. But uh, And I haven't seen any of his statements to that effect. As it stands, this bill does nothing to advocate any additional requirements or help to the police. It's merely to restrict citizens in their interactions or in documenting. Now, there's been... Ah, sorry about that. There's been Supreme Court cases where they've heard that people do have the right to film cops. If you are, by the way, in an instance where a cop is coming to ask you questions or, or asking uh, for information from you or comes to you uh, to have a discussion with you, you can't, by this law, you can't record that. You can't record it yourself. That is insane. That's crazy. Absolutely. And, and I mean, with, with everything that's happened in the past couple of years, talking about Ferguson, talk about, you know, what happened uh, in, in New York, uh, you know, all with, with uh, Eric Garner. Really? Is this really what you're going to do? You're going to propose this as the solution to, to make it, you know, so that there's less... Uh, free speech in those in those situations. There's le there's going to be less opportunity for you know exculpatory evidence to, to be created. I mean, well, well and also unintended uh, consequences here. We on the right always have to keep in mind what happens when you put a certain law into place and the left takes over. The left wins the election in that. Look, what does our um, president do with the top law uh, law enforcement? Uh, agency in the country with Eric Holder. All he's done is target conservatives, right? Look what he does with the IRS, target conservatives. The EPA, target conservatives. So do you really want a government entity, even the cops who we generally really like, but do you really want them to not be under any kind of scrutiny? I mean, what, do you like counting on, well, forever and a day they'll always be with us because I bribed them over in this one election? That's ridiculous. No foresight. Yeah. Um, from cops to cops. There we go. That's a transition, uh, and we're we're shifting. I, I I totally screwed up on on the uh, on the way that the show's scheduled. But uh, Ryan, I put it out there every week. He never <sighs> reads it. He never looks at it. I don't know why I try. I read it. I looked at it. I just screwed it up. I was, you know, yeah. I, 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 it was my fault. I'm, I'm claiming the responsibility for this, for the, uh, for the, the wrong turn there. That was, that was my bad. Um, but uh, Ryan found this excellent. This, the, the next article we're going to talk about. Ryan found a really interesting and awesome piece uh, about Les Misérables and and uh, how how we sort of bring we we admire Jean Valjean but we act like and and promote the policies of Javert and uh, Ryan I, I don't know how you found this thing it's it's like from from Berkeley from the Berkeley blog it was just in my Google Plus stream I don't even remember who shared it first 
Yeah, well, it, just it, it's it's a it was a good find. Uh, I would love it if you could uh, give us a little bit of a of a brief overview. Sure. Well, it first talks about uh, Valjean and how some of his qualities. Um, he first broke the law and got sent to prison for stealing a loaf of bread to save a child. Um, so even though he did something bad, his motives were good and. Then he spends, he's forgiven by a priest after he gets out for stealing to, so that he can get up on his feet. And then he spends his whole life kind of trying to serve other people, um, do the right thing, be forgiving of others, and be as you know, Christ-like as he can in trying to get forgiveness for these horrible things that he's done. He just has it in his mind that these things are horrible and spends his whole life trying to fix it and live up to this ideal that the priest was, that the priest said that he should be. And then on the other hand, we have Javert, who is all about the rule of law. This is the law. doesn't matter what your circumstances are. doesn't matter why you broke the law. You broke the law. You have to pay the penalty for that. Um, and then the article goes on to talk about how ironic this is that in America, we love Valjean. Um, we love people who come from hard times, who do good things, who serve people, and things like that, but our justice system is set up like Javert. We have a lot of inflexible laws. For you know, One example might be a possession law. If you get caught with a certain amount of drugs on you, there's a mandatory sentence for this. It does, the circumstances of it don't matter. I don't know, maybe that's not the best example for having other circumstances. Um, I don't know why you would really have drugs on you without intent to use or sell, but the mandatory minimum sentencing, the just blind adherence to the law in a lot of ways is not indicative of America's values of forgiveness, um, understanding, compassion, that type of thing. Um, he does propose two reasons uh, why we might be like this. Uh, it says at the very end, Javert repeatedly refers to Jean Valjean as dangerous. And there is a hint that his tremendous physical strength and strong emotions contain some more general menace. Americans in the violent 1970s and 1980s seem to accept that security requires us to ignore our intuitions about justice. Uh, and then parenthetically, a theme that continues in the current war on terror. Second, Javert discloses that he himself is from an impoverished background, but has obtained success without breaking the law. In Javert's zeal to punish Valjean, is disguised a need to deny that they have anything in common. Likewise, American punitiveness is powered in part by a need to maintain a moral gulf between the goodness we imagine in ourselves and the evil it must be defined against. Yeah, let's you know. Going back to the examples that you were that you were talking about, um, the EPA. There are so many laws out there beyond just you know uh, the 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 mandatory minimum sentencing, sentencing and all of that stuff that we blindly accept or you know we have to accept. Talk about the people who you know caught a fish that was bigger than their fishing license, brought it back in, are in jail. Stuff like that. It, it, there's there's ridiculous adherence to the law with so many different things, in regards to so many different things. People getting, you know, sued because their property, because they have a, a they, they moved some dirt on their property. It's ridiculous. Going to jail for stuff like that. Well, if I can play devil's advocate here for a moment, former Democrat, um, is the problem, I mean, don't, don't we need strict adherence to laws to have consistency? The, the second you stop being strictly adhering to laws, then you can claim bias very easily for one or another. Isn't the problem bad laws or poorly written laws that need to be changed? Okay, I agree. I think there's way too many laws, and many of them are poorly written. We need to follow laws, but we need a lot less, and we need laws that make sense that I don't remember which founder said it, but 
our system of government is set up for a moral people and it's inadequate for any other. So as America loses its morals, our type of system, or at least that was originally intended with few laws, people are kind of left alone to govern themselves with some minor exceptions. It doesn't work once we lose our morals and we've really done that to a large part, which is why we've had to have all these laws creep in. I don't know if I agree with that very much uh, about losing morals or, 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 or any of that. I, I think that the reason why we have more laws and bad laws is because it's profitable. It's because it's something that is good for a certain, uh, you know, interest party, interest group. That's why we have them. To me, at least, uh, that is that is a major reason. I, I, don't, I don't think it's because there's been a moral shift or, or something like that. But um, it, it's... To me, I, I, I get where Andy's coming from uh, regarding the strict adherence to good laws, laws that are actually you know well thought, thought out and and and, uh, and work. But that's not where we are right now, and it would be great if we could get there. But there's also there has to be carve outs for certain situations. I think. I think that there there has to be some. There's a reason why we have a judge and we don't have just a computer program. I think that that's that's something that that is, you know, I don't know what what you can say against that. What what is the role of a judge if not to, you know, fill that role? Well, I think there's really two reasons. No, I agree. There are there are excessive laws. I think there are two reasons that they exist. And one one would be power, as you're saying. They, you've got people wanting to play favorites, you know, take their issue and imp their preference and impose it on others through law. You don't live like I want you to, therefore you're punished. Um, but the other one, as you said, is money. It's the old thing. It's the speed trap theory, okay? You, you, you know, put a 40 mile an hour speed limit in a place where it should be 55 so you can raise a lot of money. You can do that with a lot of laws throughout the system just to raise a lot of money. So that's why I think we need to go through the whole system and kill tons of laws. But once once we have them in place, I, wow, I at least want fairly strict adherence. You know, I uh, because of a lot of things, including this article, I went back and watched the panel from 2014 um, that Ride on Crime did. It had Governor Perry. It had um, Grover Norquist, uh, some other people. And it was talking about criminal justice reform and how Texas had closed a prison and had been focusing more on, you know, it, Texas could not be accused of being soft on crime in any way, but, it, but listening to them talk about the reforms, about providing better programs in the criminal justice system, giving, uh, one of Perry's lines was not locking away people just because we're mad at them, but because they're bad people and that we're afraid of them and they need to be locked up and finding other solutions for the others and I, I get I, I guess where I'm, where I'm going with that is when we talk about Valjean uh, Hugo made it very clear how he was a man at heart good with good intentions at the beginning he was crushed by an unfair and unreasonable system that was overly punitive the punishment did not fit the crime and then when he re you know rejected that and when he tried to escape because things were so bad it, it went it went further and and he got more time and it, his soul was crushed in there but it was the redemptive power that happened once he left once he was out on parole the priests that had saved him things like that I think we don't look at people in the criminal justice system with that potential to have been somebody that's good that got caught in a terrible thing or or the situations that they can change. We don't believe there are Valjeans anymore. That everybody's in prison because they did something to deserve it. Oh, he must be guilty because he's got a lawyer or he must be guilty because he's in court. That you see that opinion in juries a lot. We don't we don't give the benefit of the doubt and it's hard to in some cases, but we just don't, I think, as a as a society, believe that people would be in those situations 
if they weren't innocent, regardless of how many times we see it on television that somebody is wrongfully arrested for something that turns out they didn't do. Isn't that, don't we have to blame that though on how all these court, all, all these trials have been put on TV and they've been sensationalized and they, you know, they, you've had these people that are, that we all think are obviously guilty get off. Like, you know, the whole Casey Anthony thing was, was kind of a, kind of a, that was, I, when I saw that happen, I said, okay, that's it. The jury system's had it. Let's get rid of it. Let's just go to bench trial. And I mean, that that's an overreaction in and of itself, but things like that that are just so flagrantly, obviously terrible and ridiculous, you're just going... You, you, you know, that reminds me, I read... Shake your head. I just read and watched Gone Girl in the past couple of weeks, and they had a Nancy Grace-type character... Uh, on the show, on the on, in the book, on the movie, who was that sort of person that you know tried things in the public before they were ever done, and God, that's got to be one of the worst things ever that's happened to criminal justice. And we started it back, if as far as I can recall, with OJ. Okay, mm. I had a roommate that we would get in discussions about OJ, and I'd say, yeah, OJ's guilty and stuff like, and he would get so mad at me. He's like, even if he did it which it seems that there's ample evidence, he was innocent, he was ruled innocent or not guilty by the jury, therefore he's off, stop saying he's guilty, stop hanging that over his head. Even if he is, it's better that one guilty man goes free than hundreds of innocent people go to jail, give him the benefit of the doubt that they had more information than you do, and move on. I think that's a really good point. I still think he's guilty, but... I think he had a really good point. Yeah. I still, I still think the old, it used to be in our justice system. We had juries return the verdict of not proved, and I think that needs to come back as as a verdict. Because sometimes you may think the person did it, but it wasn't really proven, as opposed to saying innocent. And I and I understand the, the complications that'll cause, but to me, there these days it seems like a lot of these trials, not proved, is more accurate than not guilty or innocent. Well, the fact is, all you have to do is be shown doing the perp walk, and your entire life is finished. It makes no difference if you're innocent, and that is a problem. Back to the question of, of uh, you know, how, how we deal with journalism and uh, how much involvement we should have in, in court trials and all that stuff. It's, it's very complicated and, and certainly a very deep issue, but I thought that that was an excellent article and everybody, I mean, we, I, I love that discussion that we just had. I thought that was certainly a, uh, a fun one and how often do we get to talk about, how, how often do, do you get to tag Les Miserables on a political video? So that's going to be a fun one when we clip that, that out and, and, uh, and put it up. But now, now I, I believe, I'm checking the checklist again, I think we are clear to move on to Fishy's piece uh, that she wrote for Free Radical Network uh, on amnesty and poverty and the the fight between the two. Right, and this kind of comes out of the discussion from last week. We won't belabor the point, but when Leslie was talking about the, the issue of people being more uh, trusting of their local and state government, the closest the government was to you, the more they, they trusted it, and that's not just... Uh, government, that's other institutions as well, charities and whatnot. It made me think about amnesty and poverty because we've, uh, if we've been studying, I've been writing about poverty issues for a couple of years now and have been intensely interested in things like Detroit and, and the destruction of Detroit, the things like, uh, you know, how these cities are suffering from systemic long term poverty. And I got to thinking, one of the wedge issues we talked occasionally about was being able to divide the, the coalition among the left and, and drive wedges between them. So as a purely political matter, but also as a, a heart matter, a conservative matter, uh, a proper way of looking at the world in conservative thought, I imagine, is what if we were to be able to say to people that poverty was something conservatives really recognized and, and 
fought hard to eliminate. It goes back to Arthur Brooks and the the what is it the uh, uh, oh gosh uh, the social justice agenda for conservatives and, and some of those pieces that have informed us that people can find in our uh, resource list on FRN. There's a lot of stuff there about poverty, but what if we could say we'd be happy to deal with amnesty as an issue and, and finding work for people who come here disadvantaged and whatever after we have dealt with the severe problem of people in our inner cities who are suffering from serious poverty. And I looked at some statistics and I started to see a pattern here. Just from the beginning of my article, the U.S. unemployment rate is now at a seven-year low. Okay, so yay, the Obama uh, economy and the administration that was touting this Obama economy as being a great recovery. But when you look below the surface, the unemployment rate for blacks was 12%. The official, you know, the, the figures that they've been able to, de to determine, 12% in February 2014, compared with 5.8% for whites. And that's from the National Urban League. Unemployment rate among blacks to 18 to 29 is 22.1% from generation opportunity. The declining labor participation rate has mean, meant that 1.7 million young adults are not counted as unemployed even though they can't find work. The U.S. population grew between 2008 and 2015 by 16.8 million people. That's 5.5% increase in population. But that was not due to an increase in birth rate because the birth rate was flat. And not only that, there were, quote unquote, 17 million jobs added during that same period, but they there's no increase in, 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 in employment, real employment, because if you had 16.8 million people coming in, you had 17 million jobs that people have taken, net, you're doing nothing. And so I thought conservatives who really got serious about dealing with poverty, and I'm talking about maybe using some of the current programs and attempting to get in there and restructure them and, and frame it from the way of, you know, we have to get serious aid from you know, dealing with education and jobs and job training into the inner cities in a big way, something along the lines of what Paul Ryan's been talking about. If we talk about those things, it is far easier for us, because there's lots of support for it, to intelligently and strongly advocate against the executive amnesty business and to put President Obama in the position of saying to people in the inner cities, to urban blacks, that he doesn't care about them, and they, they've recognized that, that he doesn't care about them as much as he cares about flooding jobs or you know flooding new people in for low wage work and jobs that they will take that could go to these people in the inner cities. I think it's a very calculated move that we could make, but it would also be one that would strengthen the anti executive amnesty argument. Well we'd have to do two parts, both of them that you mentioned. I mean the first one is very simple. Tell people, look, we every nation has its leaders that represent it. Our, nation, our leaders have to represent us. Shouldn't we employ our own people before we employ the world? Is that asking so much? And I think virtually everybody's going to say, well, yeah, that's reasonable. But that's going to ring empty if we are not also, on the right, aggressively investing in the, the inner city and in going to the inner city and saying, look, we want to employ you. We want to employ, not in Seattle, it's 15 an hour. Forget, you, you're, you're going to burn. But the rest of the cities, we want to employ you. We're excited about you. We want we want to give you jobs, okay? But here's the problem. I give you a job at a reasonable rate. My, comp, my competitor hires a bunch of illegals at a much cut rate, and they're going to, and I cannot compete against them. Help me compete against them. Vote against those who want uh, illegal immigrants, who want this kind of amnesty. Well, and, and it's, it's not just you. Sorry, I, I was just going to say, it's not just you that can't compete. It's, it's the workers who can't compete. They can't compete against somebody who is willing to take nothing off of the books. You know, something, somebody who's coming in and is willing to take far lower than the minimum wage 
uh, off of the books just to get a job. That's the thing. It's not. It's not just that it's it. Uh, it's bad for for competition. That uh, somebody who wants to employ an American versus an illegal, it's going to be tough for their for for their business. But it is impossible for a American worker to take the kind of uh, you know cuts in pay that a, a, an illegal immigrant would would be able to you know get. It's it just doesn't happen when your employment is on the books. When it's a legitimate employment, it doesn't happen. Right. The, the thing I wanted to bring up too about this is conservatives have been saying for years that uh, you know the entitlement system is broken. It is. Welfare is broken. It is. What we have to do is take those systems and turn them towards actually getting people out of poverty instead of letting the left continue to control them. And that means we can't do away with them uh, very quickly. We have to phase them out over time. We can't throw them to the wolves and have nothing to catch them with. And that means going into the schools and doubling our efforts on education, not doubling our spending, but doubling our efforts. It means going in and providing job training for people who may not have had that educational base. We're looking at communities that for 60 plus years have had dependency agendas by the people who've, ran, who've run those cities and you know, gimmies and, and corruption and all of that stuff. And their schools are a wreck. And their political systems are a wreck, but it's all they've heard because our voices haven't been there. Our voices, our presence hasn't been there to make a difference. And if we can use those programs and be a part of administering those programs, we can begin to change how they are administered and thereby reducing that burden on the rest of us in the same time. There's one part, though, we have to include that hasn't been talked about. And the part it's the part that prevents people from hiring from, get, from getting hired, it's the part that, that I think crushes the working poor and the working middle class the most, and that's the tax code. The tax code is an absolute killer for creating jobs. It is it is become so gained and so full of these exceptions and tax shelters and these different things that in some senses there's almost a wealth transfer from the lower middle class and the working class to the rich because they can find ways to get out of paying taxes. Now, we certainly want everybody to pay less taxes as conservatives. We don't like people paying high taxes, but what we need to do is try to sell people on understanding, look, if we get rid of this tax code and come up with whether it's a flat tax, a fair tax, or a national sales tax, whatever it is, stop. Give the, give, let's, let's put in a tax code where it's easy for people to pay their taxes and rich people can pay their taxes and pay more but they can still get enough money back that they're going to be happy with what they've got. Because right now, to me, that's the biggest barrier. All the other stuff is correct, and you're absolutely right on all of it. But until we fix that, we're only going to get them so far. Because right. It's, it's there's a hard too much gaming of the system, and, there's, and, it's, and it's restricting people from wanting to do more because they're worried about paying too much in tax. I really like what um, Paul Ryan had to say on the tax system, on making it flatter, making it fairer, and making it competitive. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Fishy. Or not. Um. No. <laughs> no, I was going to say just that if if conservatives focused, this is just the main thing I want people to take away from this, if conservatives focused in whatever way, whether the private sector or the public sector, spending their effort, really convincing with their actions, whole communities and inner cities that we do care about poverty, that we do care about them, that we do want to see them thrive and that we need their help in order to not have them be dug under by an influx of cheap labor. If we can turn our attention towards that, I think we can kill two birds with one stone. We can help people, whether they're ever going to vote for us or not, who really need help and who really are a drain on the system right now. And we can manage to, to push back against the president and his executive amnesty and the kind of king make you know king thoughts that he has, the king policies, the the fiats and things that he wants to create. I think it covers both bases, and I think conservatives would be well served to focus there. You know, I I think you can package it all in a 
success for the city type of thing. And I would think of four things. Number one, illegal immigration. Look, we, we got to keep in mind, if, if, you're, if you're taking care of a family here in America, you've got to feed these mouths to feed here where things cost more. If they're sending money back to Mexico, they're sending it back where a dollar is a million pesos or whatever. It's, they, that's why they can work for so much less because they're just supporting themselves and a cheap family elsewhere. We have to say, look, we have to stop the illegal immigration, first of all. It's killing your jobs. You know it. We know it. Everybody already knows that. Number two, um, something like back in business that I've proposed where, where we use, as you were saying, use the welfare unemployment system in place but re-gear it toward unleashing job creation and, and placing people. Number three, I would say the tax code, absolutely. we got to simplify it and make it, um, make it simpler and make it competitive with the world to where people can create jobs here without being punished. And number four, and this is huge, I would have a thing called success education. And I would look at the inner cities and i say, here's what we're going to do with your schools. You're spending way too much and you're spending way too much time in them. We're going to strip them down. We're going to strip them down. And to where if classes are not geared toward your kids succeeding in the free market, those classes become optional. Period. We want your kids, we want your kids to sail through. We want you to train them in just in what they need to succeed. Anything beyond that is optional. And here's what I mean. I I, I was getting my hair cut today, and the, and the girl cutting it, she says her husband is, uh, you know, he, he's going to be a, a, an engineer, and he's getting a two-year degree. And I said, oh, really, what are the classes he's taking right now? Astronomy and Colorado history, both of which have zero, zip, zilch, nada to do. With, with what he's getting into. It's a scam. It's just more courses, so more teachers have jobs, so people have to spend more money on them having jobs. Look, we have got to strip down the education system to the bare minimums. I could, you could easily get somebody through by 10th grade and have them with a high school degree that is more functional than they have right now, easily. Bring it to the inner city and say, we're going to strip this down we're going to have more jobs there because they're not going to go to illegals. We're going to simplify the tax code, and we are going to uh, do things like back in business, and we're going to get you into the workforce with just as good education and quicker. Success education, success for the inner city, the total program. It's it sounds It sounds like a plan. It sounds like something that we should do, and... I might know some people who are running some elections in urban areas, and and maybe maybe some of that'll trickle through. We'll see we'll see what happens. We'll see if that if that uh, can find its way into into the the campaigns. Um, the last the last thing that we want to talk about before we uh, before we hang it up for the night, uh, I'm going to throw it to Ryan. But you know, it's we're talking about minimum wage baristas. I mean, it's got to be in there somewhere. It's we're gonna have. Is, is Starbucks going to to hire uh, illegal immigrants as part of its new campaign? Who knows? Ryan, <laughs> you're so anxious to talk well, about this. I'll set it up while Ryan's getting himself together. Um, so the the race together campaign with Starbucks allowing its employees to have conversations about race with uh, the people who come in and order coffee, which, I mean, at first glance, you're thinking, this is going to hold up the line even further. What are they talking about? Um, but it just, it went over like a lead balloon. Uh, and Kurt, uh, as Ryan was saying, Kurt had a, quite a bit of fun with this. Let Ryan, start there, and then I'll come back and give you some other fun tweets. We think he's back. I'm back. There we go. Get off mute and everything. All right. So Kurt's hashtag was unintended. Uh, try to spell it right so that I get the hashtag pulled up. Unintended race together. And he has some really funny ones. Um, some of my favorites are. I think. Rappers who use the N-word are disgusting. Why does the president pal around with them? 
Did you know that the Republican Party was founded to oppose the Democrats' embrace of slavery? Which political party gains if blacks become affluent and which gains if blacks stay poor? Are you as disgusted as I am by the liberals' tolerance of anti-Semitism on college campuses? I disagree with liberals. I don't think minorities need scraps in the form of welfare. I think they need freedom. I think that one's probably my very favorite. Did you hear Joe Biden's latest racist comments? Um... <laughs> That's actually hilarious. <laughs> that one works pretty much any day. Yes. Hi. At most restaurants, there are many Hispanic workers, but here it's all whites. Why is Starbucks so racist? Yeah, and and that one in particular was was a you know it hit pretty hard because the tweet that that got sent out promoting the the hashtag of race together was a bunch of white hands yes! holding coffee mugs. It's like, are you serious? Did you did you really did you really tweet this out? This is this is this is your idea. I mean, you came up with this idea. It's your idea. This hashtag, race together, and you find three white people to take the. What what happened? Who who was the guy? No, it's even better. The guy, the, <laughs> Starbucks. Starbucks senior vice president of communications deleted his Twitter account over this. Totally deleted his Twitter because he was getting pushed back. Some of the comments that people were making were hilarious. I mean, Think Progress says a company that already manipulates language has no business talking about race. Listen to this. This is great. The branding of places like Starbucks are particularly obnoxious. The operation requires you to adopt a nonsensical lexicon that elevates the ordinary. Calling a cashier a barista is the equivalent of calling an Apple employee a glorified radio shock worker or a genius. Even a small is tall at Starbucks. And so they're going into the, this horrible use of language. And then there's this great business about... Um, Apparently Monday McDonald's had a thing about hugs. Today was Starbucks. So <laughs> yesterday, talk about love at McDonald's. Today, talk about race at Starbucks. Tomorrow, psychoanalysis from a guy who makes blizzards at Dairy Queen. It's stuff like that. They were just so ripe for this. Gwen Eiffel even tweeted something like, if you want to have a conversation with race with me before I've had my morning coffee, before I've had my morning caffeine, you're in a world of trouble. Dad, it was great. It's uh, another one. I go to Chipotle for the literature and Starbucks for the real talk about race. And then, you know, some of these are just so hilarious. Um, this uh, lady, Coco Fascio, uh, tweeted out, I get what Starbucks is trying to do, but nah, I'm just there trying to get a caramel macchiato. And then Jessica Meisner if only Selma had put in a Starbucks. Brutal. Absolutely brutal. And they brought this on themselves. I, I don't understand. I mean, how did this get past the marketing team? How did this get past the communications team? How did this get past the CEO? Who was the genius that said, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's do this. George, you have to say what you were going to say in the chat, what you said in the chat. Well, I, I feel like we're leaving all the other fast food cookie places out, so I'm guessing, you know, at Wendy's we can have uh, equal pay for women, and at Taco Bell we can talk about disease, or as Ryan Bickmore said, Montezuma's Revenge. I think that's even more accurate. Oh, remember, we were always talking about that meat product. What was it that they called the pink stuff? What was that? That was the big pink thing? slime, and it's a horse. <laughs> Oh my God! There's been nothing overblown as much as pink slime. What about Burger King? What's the thing we can talk about at Burger King? So we've got we've got McDonald's taking care of and Starbucks and Taco Bell and Wendy's. What can we talk about at Burger King? Their slogan: Executive orders. Maybe executive if, if executive somebody, orders at, at Burger King. That's what we can talk can about. We can have uh, Burger Queen cups if someone wants to talk gay issues. Look, I'm I'm stretching. I'm trying. 
What if what if you want what if you want to have uh, can does this go both ways? Can you do race to can you do race to hate if you want to be racist? If you want to talk about races you just hate or groups you hate, and you can like indicate that on the cup, and then you and the person can have a really good dialogue for you know 20, 30 minutes while people are waiting for their cappuccino. How about people we hate in particular? Not not races necessarily, but like specific celebrities or politicians. Or oh my God! This is race. We, yeah, you write a name on there, and you can together hate on them for a long time while people wait in line. I like. I, I would go to a place like that. Absolutely. You know what? That is this, a brilliant idea. It's done. It's over. We're 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 over. It's done. It's this is the end of the refinery. Here we are again. Thanks to Andy. He's he's just. Wow. Yeah, I, think, I think I'm going to have to step back in here and say, you know, we started out being silly and funny because we were happy about BB winning, and now we're closing with the silly and funny because Starbucks is stupid. Another progressive company doing something really stupid. At least they're outing themselves and making sure that we understand when you buy something at Starbucks, you are supporting the progressive cause. And if you choose not, if you don't want to support the progressive cause, don't buy coffee at Starbucks. You have other, had, plenty of other choices. I had to add this one thing. It was uh, someone made the point that the same folks who are upset at Hobby Lobby for their political positions as they see them and Chick Fil A. Are right. the same people that are pushing this from Starbucks, right? And I, you know, I certainly don't care about boycotting, and I can't not shop at Starbucks any more than I already don't shop at Starbucks. I'll I'll not buy from Starbucks while I'm not watching MSNBC and CNN. Um, but it, you know. I'm not interested in supporting the progress in growing the progressive movement in any way, so I don't buy Ben and Jerry's and I don't buy Starbucks coffee. Um, you know, the sacrifice that I'm making of not having that flavor of ice cream or that cup of coffee, I, you know, those are the kind of hard sacrifices I'm willing to make because I'm a true fighter for the cause. And I do have to laugh at the people who are like, well, I would, I, you know, I really hate progressives, but. I really need coffee, so I'm going to go ahead and buy coffee at Starbucks because it's like um, convenient for me, although it tastes terrible. But they're there, and they're convenient, and I buy it, and I don't want to support the progressive movement, but that's what I do because, you know, the Dunkin' Donuts is on the wrong side of the street. All right. This is you're, a really a, you're really a conservative warrior. Get out of my face. This is a brand new reason to go to Chick-fil-A. Absolutely. Go Get their coffee. There, you are safe. From people trying to raise your awareness with their opinions. Shipley's Donuts, Dunkin' Donuts, they, you know, places that just want to serve you some food. And without oh, food, just food, no lecture. That is so backward and not open-minded to simply serve food for money. I mean, what, what are they thinking? Crazy. The normal crazy. reason to go to Krispy Kreme. Hey. That's crazy. Yeah, we can't go to Krispy Kreme in Texas. Besides which, I don't like their donuts, so I don't care about that. Chick Fil A. That's what? the thing. Chick Fil A. You get your lectures outside of the of the place from the people picketing the Chick Fil A's. Right. Versus Starbucks, you where you get your lectures. You get good inside. service and it's, good food in a clean place when you go to Chick Fil A. I mean, it's terrible. Back, back to my all racist idea. Would hate fillet be picking? Would that be taking too much of their brand? Would they probably that'd probably be a copyright infringement. Because I think I'm I'm telling you this could work. You come here to have great chicken, and hate with a side of hate. Yes. Waffle fries that look like the face of the person that your boot stomped in, right? Because you stomp on somebody's face with your boot and leave the waffle imprint. The waffle fries. Okay, am I the only one that meet when any time? Somebody brings up Chick Fil A. I immediately think waffle fries. No, no, I do too. I love them. I get them crispy. Yeah. Okay, so I think we've pretty much run out of. Well, we ran out of smart things to say a long time ago, but we probably have run out of the uh, goodwill of our listeners at this point. So we should probably wrap it up before they decide that they hate the refinery. Um, and just say, oh, guys, we're going to try better next week, particularly with the whole technical problems that we had. I am so sorry about that. And it took us 15 minutes to figure out that we weren't broadcasting live. That's pretty embarrassing. And 
like I said, during that time, George said some really, really brilliant things, and it's just, it's sad. It wasn't completely lost. It'll be spliced in later. <sighs> At any rate, um, is everybody okay with us saying goodbye for the week? Think so? Yeah? <laughs> every week. Exactly. Every damned week, yeah. Um, JD's head in his hands. We have embarrassed him or frustrated him or irritated him yet again, so we know we have absolutely achieved. At any rate, I want to thank everybody who has stuck with us for the two full hours that we've been talking and broadcasting this week. Uh, unintentional, technical problems, that kind of stuff, it happens. Really appreciate your presence, and um, I'll give you my email address if you want to send some presents. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, okay, I will see, we will see all you guys next week. Next. And be sure to watch Foreign Matters, Foreign Matters Thursday. 10 o'clock, 5 p.m. Uh, Eastern. And what's the best way to find it? Uh, it'll be on the Facebook page, the Free Radical Network Facebook page, and tweet it out, all that fun stuff. Go to freeradicalnetwork.com, and you will find all of the information you need to get to Foreign Matters, right? Face Our Facebook page, our Facebook page and our Twitter. Yeah, I don't do Facebook, so I'm not going to even talk about it. And um, G+. It'll be on G+, too. Somewhere. We don't know where. Um... <laughs> I'm so sorry, y'all. I've honestly been working too many hours. Anyway, we will see you guys next week on Tuesday at 845 Central. Thank you so much for your patience, your tolerance, your appreciation, your understanding, and your efforts at growing the conservative movement. Thanks. Bye.